Felix here, and good morning to this Monday morning live. It is, uh, well, not the greenest of mornings, let's just put it that way. So it's going to be a really interesting week, a massive, massive earnings week this week with pretty much everybody who matters reporting in the next 72 hours or so. Of course, we'll be covering that here on this channel. So don't be shy and smash that subscribe button. And let's get cracking straight away. Let me show you a little bit here. Well, first of all, the real excitement, of course, that this isn't financial advice. No, it's not. It's hopefully vaguely entertaining entertaining and a little bit more than vaguely educational. So let me show you just where we are right now with the market. So uh, looking pretty gloomy, but not quite as gloomy as we were looking about an hour ago. Um, S&P and NASDAQ are down about half a percentage point. Volatility is up. Uh, it was up a little bit more uh, just now. So it's kind of, kind of actually mellowing a little bit here. Uh, Possibly partially because we've got some good earnings out. I just saw Coca Cola numbers. They're looking really pretty, pretty, uh, pretty sweet, uh, I would say. Uh, sugar free and sweet, zero calories and, and happy all around. So that's definitely a positive. Let's look at the stock market here before we run through some key news. So there's a lot of red here, right? A lot of Chinese red numbers, and that's what's been weighing on stocks this morning. So European stocks uh, were down significantly today. Why? Well, partially because the lockdowns in China continue. And that, of course, the longer that continues, the more of a knock-on effect it has on supply chain and inflation and just a factory's ability to produce stuff everywhere in the world, not just in China. And uh, the uh, yeah, it's basically COVID is it, it, rampant across China. Well, it, it is everywhere. Why wouldn't it be there, really? Uh, here, x banks down, Tesla down 2% to 982. Also, some interesting Elon news it does seem that the Twitter deal might be tweeting its way through, which we're going to touch upon as well. Of course, Neo is down at the moment 1.7%. Now, is there anything up today? Yeah, Twitter, because actually the deal might be going through. It looks like it might go through as soon as today. And Snow, volatility, Snap coupang app and that's about it so not exactly the most glorious morning here and then shareholders of all those companies reporting like amazon and so on a little bit on the edge uh, activision actually we've also reported some numbers today which were a little bit disappointing their number one game not selling quite as well as usual so the qqq now are down almost half a percentage point this morning so what does that mean well it means it's a marvelous beautiful wonderful day to buy some great stocks and it's also a fantastic day to sell some options which is what I'll be doing straight after this, this uh, live call here. I have a live stream with all of my master option students, and I love it when I wake up on a Monday morning and volatility is high. It just makes the week that much more profitable. So this is who's reporting today. Uh, Activision already reported today this morning, Coca-Cola as well. Uh, what about the big ones? Well, today, the other ones don't matter as much, but tomorrow, Alphabet, as in Google, Microsoft, Visa, 3M, these are massive, massive companies. And on Wednesday, we get Pinterest, Spotify, Teladoc, Upwork, Facebook, and Ford, the two Fs, uh, reporting. And of course, some of the other ones as well. I'm not saying that those I don't read out are not massive companies, just they're not quite as popular. Amazon reporting on Thursday, Roku as well, MasterCard, McDonald's, Twitter reporting on Thursday. And then at the end of the week, we're going to get a, a bit of oil and that sort of thing thrown in, Chevron, Exxon, and so on. So it's it's a definitely a monster week. But really, of course, what matters is is the the alphabet, the Microsofts, uh, those kind of kind of numbers coming out in the next couple of well days. Uh, GM as well reporting on Tuesday. So watch out for those those numbers. Now, uh, you can also watch out for that lovely ticker. We've got our Master Ops program. Uh, tons and tons of you enrolling over the weekend, which is marvelous. Why is it marvelous? Because you're going to make more money. Well, that's the intention. And that's what I'm doing. So, so check it out here. Um, of course, uh, with all of this, what we're talking about here, like, for example, Neo here. This is an interesting story. I don't know if you've seen that yet. Pony AI is a company in China that is invested into by both Toyota and Neo Capital, the, the private equity arm of capital, or of Neo rather, and they, basically they drive around uh, self-driving, and they just got their first or the first taxi license, which means the driverless vehicles will be allowed to now charge fees. So we already have driverless vehicles, typically with a sleeping driver on the front seat for regulatory purposes, but they're not actually allowed to make any money out of this. These guys now are. So it's a really interesting one. A hundred of these driverless vehicles will be in, in Nancha, in Guangzhou, uh, driving around, which is a 
key part of Guangzhou. So that's an interesting one. Now, what I mean is don't now run out and just throw all your money at NEO. Uh, what I always encourage you to do is that you look at the fundamentals, look at your diversification and so on. So look at our live portfolio tracker, for example, here. Just put your tickets in here. Uh, you can see how diversified you are across stocks and, indice and, and, and industries. This is not my portfolio, by the way. My portfolio is over on the Patreon as well. And then you can you can zoom into that and you can see, hey, you know, what are what are my margins? Uh, what are the returns of these companies? And that's really key to understand. You know, understand where these companies lie and sit and how they develop quarter over quarter. I really recommend you get your hands on this or any other kind of uh, sort of life tracker that gives you that kind of number. So you can see why I like some stocks like Estee Lauder. I did a video on last week. Um, IDEX, I'm a big fan of 102% return on equity. Um, Facebook, you know, amazing numbers, uh, Mili, Idex, those kind of stocks I, I'm a big fan of. So check it out. Uh, and how do you do that? You just go to felixfans.org slash Patreon down below. That black bar down there uh, gets you there. And um, the green banner there, it does say until the 18th of April, but that's actually wrong. I did extend it one week, but I haven't updated this particular banner. So it expires, as, as I say, in, in, in just under 15 hours here. So uh, what else we got in stock for you? Here's the Coca-Cola uh, results that just came out 30 minutes ago. And um, that's a marvelous brand, isn't it? Have you ever been anywhere in the world where there wasn't Coca-Cola? I mean, I've been in some pretty remote places where there was you know, no power, no running water and that sort of thing, but there was Coca-Cola. They really have an incredible distribution and brand here. They um, said their Russian suspension of operations would impact profits by about 1% to 2%, uh, but it left their annual comparable earnings per share growth unchanged at 5 to 6%. So they obviously think they're doing well. They're able to kind of catch up with that. Net revenue is now $10 billion in the first quarter, beating analyst estimates of $9.83 billion. And um, net income, so profits, that is, uh, is, is up 24% to $2.78 billion or 64 cents a share that's for the first three months of the year so pretty staggering numbers really so they're going to make over 10 billion profit uh, this year by the looks of that now um iceman asking about adr's neo delisting super happy to get into that um give me a minute i'll run through some more news and we'll we'll, we'll talk about that uh, very gladly iceman appreciate the question um you actually lead us nicely into, into the China story, and that's this here. China is cracking down on corruption again. And this is not a new thing. This has been going on for years. A graft corruption at all levels of government is a problem, well, everywhere in the world, really. But China is, is taking a pretty stern, stern view of it. And they've just removed the president of the China Merchants Bank, which is one of the bigger banks, really is a pretty significant bank. And at the same time, we have got lots of lockdowns. And the concerns are there are cases now in Beijing. Uh, might they therefore lock down Beijing and sort of a lockdown the economy with it uh, some more. That's really one of the key reasons stocks are down this morning. So <clears throat> the, um, uh, yeah, China Merchants is China's largest retail bank and the shares are, are, are down 20% over the last five days, which is pretty significant here. At the same time, they are telling uh, pension funds and banks and so on to buy more shares, basically to kind of prop up the market. So it's an interesting one here. Um, yeah, so lots of quite senior people here being basically clamped down on or, you know, investigated and so on. And then, of course, the fun story of the day is Elon. Here he is. It seems that the Twitter board had a change of heart and that they realized this is going to happen with or without them. And somehow they want to they want to negotiate something. They might want to negotiate a nice exit package for themselves. That's typically what boards do. They very rarely actually act in the interest of shareholders. Mostly it's in self-interest, which is why it's really important to see who's on the board and how they're getting paid, preferably in shares and, and not really in, in money. So it, it seems that the social media company is working to hammer out terms of a transaction and could reach an agreement as soon as when? Monday, today. So that's interesting. Wayne, uh, thanks for throwing that out there. I did read that the main Foxconn factory is actually manufacturing. Uh, but yes, the lockdowns will affect absolutely everything and everybody. And speaking of which, the NEO 
uh, R and D center in Shanghai is is back to work, but only with about a quarter of its employees. So it isn't just manufacturing; it's also you know development, R and D, research, all that stuff. It all needs to take place. And if you knock out a week or two, well, you're just going to end up being a week or two late. And does that matter? Yes, it matters. It's like compounding, right? If you buy shares today or in seven days' time, does it matter? Of course it does. If you buy every single time you buy shares seven days later, you'll lose a lot of money. It's very very simple. So. That's where we are at the moment here with the market. Uh, really only Twitter up, and, and, and that's pretty much it. Um, fix is still up as well, which is a good good thing for us option sellers here. Now, Angel drove a Polestar yesterday. Loved it. They were booked for three days prior for the test drive. Angel, thank you very much for sharing that. If you have any, any, if you have any pictures or anything, Angel, or a video, or anything like that, do shoot it over to me. I, lo I love seeing those. Let me put my email on the screen here for you. Um, and I'll share that with the, with the community. Uh, it is Felix, what's my name, at Goat, goatacademy.org. Always feel free to drop me an email with anything kind of vaguely finance related or, you know, a fuzzy creature related. You know, I'm always happy to see those things. So, so do share that out there. Now, as for, uh, as for um, a Neo delisting, okay, so there are essentially... Two, two sides to this. First of all, we're getting a lot of noise from Chinese regulators, including, I think, yesterday or the day before um, at that conference in, in Beijing, uh, saying, look, we're really close. We're making good progress. We're talking to the US side every single week. And, and we do think this whole uncertainty, as they describe it, in their words, not mine, is, is going to go, it's going to be resolved soon. So they, they sound pretty confident. Now, of course, the proof's in the pudding. Uh, or, you know, when the fat, la fat lady sings or whatever else you can, you can think of to describe that. So that's positive. Now, the negative, of course, is that it does need U.S. approval, essentially. It's, it's the U.S. who has, has all the power, really, here, and, and, and China who's got to move. So now, say there is a delisting. And we, are, we did see Lee Auto added to that list of companies that have been notified, which means they now have uh, two years, I believe, uh, to, to basically uh, comply with that. And it's, there's a possibility, sorry, I think it's still three years, but there's legislation in in, in both uh, the Senate and Congress, one wanting to shorten it to one year, the other wanting to shorten it to two years. So let's just assume it's going to go to one or two years. So they have that time period to comply. Now the companies, it's not within their power to comply. It's only within Beijing's power to let them comply. And what that means is that if the ADRs do get removed from New York, of course, it's a it's a big hit for the U.S. financial industry as well as, as for, for shareholders, and it'll wipe off quite a lot of U.S. capital because there are quite a lot of U.S. funds invested into ADRs. What happens? Well, if there's a listing in Hong Kong and that continues, that's great, but you have still removed the ability of most American which is where most of the money is, funds to really buy those shares. So you would still lose probably something like two-thirds, 70% of your shareholders who simply wouldn't go and buy in Hong Kong, and, and therefore you would see a significant drop in share price. I think, I think that's a fair, fair statement. Okay, so brilliant. All right, so let, let's uh, moving on here quite nicely. So, what have we got in store uh, this morning? Well, the Elon story is one that kind of dominates the space that literally everybody's talking about. Uh, is is exactly that that they are apparently in the final stretches of hammering out a deal, um, and um, around that 43 billion bid. So they basically, uh, rumors are that Twitter have come out saying we are working on something around Elon's um, final bid. So it might well be the original bid. There's probably just going to be a little bit of, uh, you know, brown envelope jobs type thing. Uh, they don't call them that, but that's essentially what it is. To uh, to management, you know, they get they get sort of payouts and settlement agreements and that kind of thing. Because I think he wants to sack them all anyway. So I guess if he comes to a, a decent agreement with them all, uh, for, from their point of view, they get enough money, they'll probably walk away. Now, the US is also sending more aid to the Ukraine, another $700 million. And the US is now actually saying they kind of want to like weaken Russia in this conflict. So it really is becoming another Cold War, isn't it? It's becoming, it's kind of becoming another Vietnam or something like that. And I, I don't mean that obviously hopefully in the outcome of the war, but you know, where one side was uh, funding originally and then fighting themselves, hopefully that doesn't happen. But it's one of those proxy wars, isn't it? Uh, where, where Russia is in there and then the West is now funding and equipping 
uh, the Ukraine hoping to kind of beat Russia. It's it's, it's a really odd one here. Uh, in France, if you care, the uh, pr president of France, Emmanuel Macron, he has won uh, by a worse margin than 2017. He's beaten um, Marine Le Pen to to the to the to the poll really which is good news for markets i would say because the markets tend to prefer predictable politicians who don't do much versus uh, those ones who are possibly going to do stuff so not not much is going to happen there for in france and that's a good thing for markets the markets like certainty they definitely don't like anything unusual if you are into um, arms manufacturers with your investing then it's probably a good time for them um, basically um you know, arms spending is going up significantly. Of course, the US always leading that pack, but we're just seeing that go up. And um, Europe, which is about 20% of global defense spending, is, is significantly ramping up their spend. That's definitely something to, to watch out for. Um, Amazon's union uh, kind of um, wrangles are continuing as well. They are voting again today at the Station Island Center, Sourcestart Sorting Center, whether or not to unionize. Uh, which is an interesting one. So uh, we watch watch out for Amazon there. That'll be a, be a big one to watch. And the whole knock-on effect of Ukraine here and, and the desire to go off oil and gas and China's desire to stop importing stuff from um, uh, from Australia and so on essentially has the effect that coal uh, fired, fired power plants are again, again going up. Uh, their usage is going up substantially, so not exactly good for the planet. So that's basically where we go. We're trying to cut down gas and oil, and therefore we're burning more coal, which is kind of an odd one here. Now, lots, of course, of inflation talk. Lots of people saying the Fed's losing control and so on. Uh, it does seem to be now the case that May is firmly expected to be a half a percentage point interest rate, and the next one might be as well. So the economy is possibly going to get hit with this double whammy of high inflation and a break on GDP growth through the um, interest rate uh, hikes. Uh, and then, of course, you have people's ability to spend money gets reduced. Why? Well, if you make things like mortgage costs higher, uh, car loans higher, and all the other things that people have loans on, credit card balances and so on, then they have less disposable income. So that's one, one to watch out for. And really, one thing I would always say to you is, seriously, don't have any personal loans. Uh, don't have credit card balances. Don't 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 do any of that. It really is a load of nonsense. Uh, the best thing you can do is to get rid of all of that, and then once you've done that, build a good stock portfolio. Uh, go and build an extra income stream with options investing, which is what we are doing. And I'd be live again in about thirty minutes with my students, my master option students, to show them my trades for the week. And it's going to be an interesting week with all the earnings and everything else coming out. So definitely watch out for that. Market's not really improving so far here in the last ten minutes or so. We are down uh, broadly 0.4 to 0.45% across all the major markets. Uh, Russell is down 0.6%. Even VIX now uh, pretty much flat at 28. That's still a pretty high level. Europe closed more than a percentage point down. Um, uh, Iceman here asking, what options do us Neo uh, ADR holders have at 70% down already uh, if selling is not an option? Well, I think... The first thing I would always say is if you are investing in growth stocks, you need ideally a 10-year horizon. Why? Because you need to allow the companies to demonstrate that they can generate the growth. And that means developing the products, bringing them out to market, and getting a substantial uh, customer base for that. And at that point, you get that reward, possible reward from, from the, the, the stock price. In the short term, Growth stocks are the worst thing to put your money into because they're just hugely volatile. It's a bit like REITs. You can't buy a REIT for a month. It really makes no sense. You buy it for 10 years, you're probably going to make money. And that's a little bit the same with, with, with growth stocks. So I think what I would generally say is that there really are only two valid strategies of investing. One is you look for undervalued companies. Maybe you, look, you work with technical analysis or so on, and you find good, smart entry points. And the other is to simply average and just to say, I'm going to put $100 into this basket of 10 growth stocks every single Monday or every single month. And um, I wouldn't do it quarterly. I do it monthly at least. And, and that way you will just average in and you don't give a, give a hoot what the price is. So you just keep doing that. And that way you will not make the mistake of buying at the top of the market and then 
selling at the bottom of the market, which is what most, most retailers do. So you have to really ask yourself, like, you know, do you still like the stock? Has anything changed? Like go at something like our portfolio tracker here, you know, put in Neo, uh, track what they've done, look at what their margins are, look at how they've developed over time. Uh, you know, what are you seeing? Um, and what I'd literally do is, you can see here the, the present gross margin, but what I would do is make another column here and, and write down what Q1 margin was and then what Q2 margin is and what Q3 margin is. Just add columns to it. You can you can add to your heart's content on these sheets. Just click on file, uh, make a copy, and then you have your own and it still links all the data in. And that way you know whether or not your stock's improving fundamentally and whether the, the short-term market madness is the wrong thing, is it's just mad. Now, of course, as we are heading into more of a downturn, possibly a recession, at what time is it is it marvelous to buy options again? Well, typically it's once you are in the recession. Once you have just begun the recession, that's typically the best point to load up on growth stocks because that's when they are most undervalued because everyone got scared out of them. Now, when you then go back into the boom and into the exuberance, that's typically the worst point to buy growth stocks at the best time to buy the sort of value stocks, you know, buying your your Amazons, your, uh, you know, IDEX, your Microsoft, those kind of kind of, kind of of stocks that are a lot less sexy, you know, you're into it and all these kind of things. Uh, and because people are not looking at those and they underperform. And we saw that last year, right? Remember, remember 2020, everyone was laughing at Warren Buffett because his portfolio massively underperformed the market. And everyone's like, oh, the guy's too old. He's missed the boat. No, he just understands exactly how the cycle works. And he doesn't bother with the cyclicality of it because he, he knows he's going to come out of it making a lot of money. Um, the C limited ADR is in Singapore. Um, so, uh, Southeast Asian stocks, generally speaking, do comply. I mean, every, since this uh, Sorbonne Oxley act in 2002, every foreign company listed in the U S has to comply with that and show their audit papers and they all do comply. Otherwise they would have a problem. The only ones who don't to my understanding are the Chinese ones. Uh, Iceman saying, if we have a 10 to 20 year horizon, list delisting has no effect on NEO. Unfortunately not. And that's not quite how it works because you still have to monitor what happens with your stocks. You still have to see, are they executing well? And there will be some growth companies that are not or that have geopolitical things happen to them that don't make, no longer make them a good investment. Now, with Chinese stocks, all I'm saying is it's about position sizing because there is a potential for delisting. I hope it's not going to happen. I don't think China has any interest in getting delisted, but there is a potential, right? I mean, the midterms at the moment look like, for example, Democrats might lose that. You might get then a, a more uh, stern anti-China uh, House and Senate uh, and, and uh, Congress and Senate. And, and that might, again, not work in, in the favor of, of getting to a deal here. So maybe that's also why China is keen to get this deal over the line before midterms, which I think would be a smart decision. So there are risks with every single investment you make and you have to kind of therefore break them down. I mean, I have something like 30 stocks or something and four or five of those stocks brought me 80% of my returns last year. The other 25 didn't really do very much. Two or three lost money and the others didn't really do anything at all. And that's the intention. And next year, it'll be another five stocks that'll give me virtually all of my returns. But you never know which ones those are. So that's why a smart diversification, not for the sake of it. I mean, I think there's little point in buying Neo, Tesla, Xpang, Li, and BYD, for example. I think you're buying five times more or less the same risk profile with the exception of, of Tesla being a US company. So I think, you know, you've got to be smart about this. Um, if you want to learn more about that, we, we do have lots and lots of programs on this. So do check that out. If you go on the website, um, we um, you might want to have a look at the um, financial freedom program on the website at Um There we go. So... Um, there we are with that. So really, I think, I think what, what I would say to you is, you know, you, you have to take investing really very seriously. Like there is really one skill that you need to have, um, and that's becoming a great investor or a great trader or a great options trader. And you need to take that first leap. You need to take, take that first step. And that's a, that's a difficult thing. Most people just think about it. They fret about it. They complain about it, but they very, very rarely actually take a step to really master that skill. So if you want to, I kind of, with my, all my students, one of my key aims is to get you to basically build that momentum to not just take the first step, but then once you've taken that, uh, take steps two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And, and that's why we offer a, uh, 
not just our programs, but we also offer our, our coaching programs. So if you want to book a call with that, feel free to. Here it is. If you book, go to felixfrenzelog slash call, you can uh, chat about that. Uh, we also have, a, as I say, we have a coaching program as well for those of you who want more hand-holding. And really, you have to kind of ask yourself, do you want to become a better investor? Do you want to get improvement in your returns? Do you want to like provide better for your family, your children, your loved ones, your Labradors, whatever it might be? And you're a third of the way through 2022 now and, you know, have has your skill level significantly improved? That's really what I would always ask myself. And that's what I ask myself. I always work with coaches all year round, different ones all the time because I like to absorb. And really for that, you need to kind of snap out of this routine that most of us are in. You know, most of us are a little bit lethargic. We sit there and we work away for 10, 12 hours a day doing our jobs. It's that sort of rat race, traveling back and forth from places we don't necessarily want to be. Now, how do you snap yourself out of that? There are lots of techniques for that. I mean, you can, I like to get up, jump on the floor, 250 push-ups. That changes my whole energy, heat, everything. Or you could just, you know, sit up straight, Put puff your chest out a little bit and look around like you own the world. Little things like that kind of help to kind of snap you out of this mindset, this monotony that we get lulled into. The other thing, of course, is, is throw your television out of the window. Seriously, get rid of the damn thing. Um, so once you've snapped yourself out of that, get a pen and paper. Write down what your passions are. What do you love? What do you hate? Hating is usually much easier to write down, actually, for most people, I find. If I ask them, what do you really want to be? They go, oh, I haven't really got a goal yet for the next 12 months. Um, if you then ask them, well, what do you really hate? What job would you loathe to do? Um, you know, who would you hate to hang out with? Where would you hate to live? That works really quite well. And they write that down. And then you can say to them, well, now write down the opposite. And, and, and then that gets some energy going, that gets some blood pumping, that gets some passion up to the top of the head again. And then with that passion, you are now in a space where you can actually commit to change, where you can actually commit to taking that leap. But that's actually what it takes. And you can do this several times a day. And, and you will need to do it again and again and again. I mean, I also need to do it sometimes. I get tired sometimes and I look at a screen for too long and then I think, okay, let's go and do something about this. And then we do. So I, you know, I see so many people I get messages from and, and get emails from, and they're almost always very, very kind, and I really appreciate that. But I see so many retail investors who have this hope strategy. Oh, I'll just wait it out, and it'll be fine. And that's rarely a good plan. You kind of need to have a little bit more, more than hope. And usually the best thing to do is just learn from people who, who've been there, learn from people who've done it. If you want to squeeze you know, a couple of decades of experience into a few weeks, that's a smart move because that gets you there much, much faster. And that's what I do. That's what I do with my with my mentors and my coaches. And that's what I then try to pass on, pass on to my students and my 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 mentees. So check it out. Uh, check out our options mentoring program. That's for, for students who have um, a six-figure portfolio or, or, or more. Go to felixvenselog slash coaching or, or simply uh, jump on the uh, master options program, for example, uh, which is right here, felixvenselog slash options. Uh, take advantage of that coupon success, which expires today and get that boost to your income and learn a real skill because there is really a skill. It's not that it's not really common sense. Options trading, it isn't. It's not something you're born with. It's something you have to acquire. And then once you've done that, acquire the next skill and then another one and then another one and then another one and set your life like that. And it's much more exciting. It's much more fun rather than just sitting there doing the same job for years and years and years and years. So And Michael, you're completely right. If people learn risk management first, uh, then that would really, really help. And you know, that's one of the key things I teach my option students is first of all, uh, don't risk any money whatsoever at the beginning. We we practice in paper trading, and then once we move into real money trading, you know, do a trade where the maximum you could lose is a hundred dollars. That's not really going to kill you. Uh, and and then you know you get more comfortable with that, and and you set up trades where there is a flaw to the amount of money it could lose you if you were utterly, butterly wrong. But we use statistics, we use numbers, we use criteria and a method that actually works rather than hope, uh, which is just not not really, doesn't shouldn't really have a place in, in, in your uh, strategy at all. Um, and uh, Niels, uh, I did see that Twitter um, announcement there that was out a little little while ago. Thank you for posting that. I appreciate that. It does seem that Twitter has had a change of heart over the weekend and that they are negotiating with Elon to accept his offer. Um, my my uh, 
guess on that is that they're likely going to want to want to get some payouts for for themselves. So, uh, Nazi thoughts on the PayPal earnings um, expectations. I, I Nazi, I appreciate the question. I I, I personally am, am a big fan of of PayPal. I, you know that that doesn't mean you should run out and buy it. Uh, you, you obviously have to come to your own conclusion here. Um, where did it go actually on here? They are reporting and they're reporting tomorrow. I thought they were reporting tomorrow. It's not on this particular list. But uh, anyway, the problem we've seen with a stock like PayPal or Netflix, who are kind of like this beast of free cash flow and market share, they they do one teeny tiny little thing a little bit wrong or pre don't present it in quite the right way and the stock tanks massively. So I would be very cautious on that, just like with Netflix. Um, like I told uh, my master option students, I, and I know you're one of those, Nazi, uh, the same thing last week. I not, wouldn't touch Netflix. I wouldn't touch PayPal this week on an options front either. If you uh, like the stock and it does tank after earnings, then of course you can buy some more. That might not be such a bad decision, but I would be a little bit cautious with that. It's going to be very, very volatile. Uh, Angel, I don't think the Twitter um, acquisition has anything whatsoever to do with, with Tesla. Uh, basically, it's going to be financed. I think it's JP Morgan who are putting up about 30 billion or so in, in, in debt. And you could then put that debt against Twitter. So Twitter might pay off that debt over time. That's typically how these things are done because it's going to be taken private, right? You can acquire a company and, and let the company you're buying pay for your debt. That's a, that's a popular way of doing that. And then Elon said he's putting up uh, from memory about 12 billion or so from his personal funds. And he obviously has uh, 12 billion personal funds. He also, the way he gets paid largely is not by selling shares, but by borrowing against them. So that's what most billionaires do who own public listed companies. They just go to the bank, they go to JP Morgan and go, look, I own 100 billion of shares. Will you please lend me 10 billion and I pay you 0.1% interest on that? And they go, yes, please. Uh, and then you've got the money. It's a loan. It's tax free. In fact, it even creates an expense which might be tax deductible because you have to repay the, 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 the interest, right? So that's how they do it. So he's, he's got plenty of money. I'm not too worried about that. Now, I suppose the only concern is, is this going to distract him from running his existing six companies because running Twitter is another big job. Meta earnings are scaring users of FR8. Well, let's see what they bring in. It'll be an interesting, definitely it's going to be an interesting week. Uh, and that's another one that might be quite volatile this week. Uh, speaking actually of tax deductions, a lot of you are telling me that you are able to tax deduct our, our uh, courses, programs, and coaching programs. So uh, bear that in mind. Maybe have a chat with your accountant. Obviously, I can't give you advice on that particular front. Now, market overall here, Twitter is up, snow is up, volatility is up. And that's pretty much it. Um, the rest is sort of like kind of trading sideways. And then there is a lot of red. Look at that here. A lot of Chinese red. Barbara now at $82. There were quite a few headlines out over the weekend from analysts saying uh, the worst might not be over yet because uh, the following. So say Alibaba, right? Decent business. Yes. But the macroeconomic situation in China isn't going to be great. If you lock everybody down and you've got COVID and shutdowns and all that sort of stuff, it means your GDP growth won't be as great. It means that consumer confidence won't be as great. Therefore, people will buy less stuff. Therefore, what's the real turning point, the catalyst for Alibaba earnings over the next couple of quarters? I, I don't really see where it's going to come from. And then on the cloud business, which is really their kind of hope to use that unfortunate word. The um, government seems very, very reluctant now to use Alibaba Cloud. And that means that all state-owned enterprises, which is basically, for example, the entire financial sector, which is where Alibaba was very strong, uh, might all move off the cl Alibaba Cloud. There are big cities like Tianjin and some of the smaller cities around Shanghai who already told all their enterprises stop using private cloud companies. So uh, there was a comment from a Chinese analyst saying that uh, Ali Cloud or Ali Yun, as it's known, uh, has, has an Alibaba problem because they have an association with a company that isn't necessarily politically in the best spot at present. So uh, that's kind of where we are. So so the lockdowns, no, I don't think they are good for Alibaba at this point anymore. I think it was the initial thing that was, yes, people spent more money online. It was short-lived, but now it's been going on for so long. It just reduces consumer demand and it reduces consumer confidence. Uh, and I think therefore 
combine that with the whole political issues, I, I don't think that's actually going to be very good. So um, I do have a little bit of Alibaba uh, I, still, but I, I, I haven't bought any since, uh, I don't know, March last year or something like that. So it's, it's, it's kind of, um, as a percentage, getting smaller and smaller because I keep buying everything else. So there we go. So I got guys, um, I will be jumping live onto the master options um, live stream in about 15 minutes or so. So I need to do a little bit of uh, screen preparing for that. Uh, to get on that and see me trade options live every week, uh, go to phoenixfriends.org slash options. Uh, check out the coupon code success that expires in about 14 hours. And uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you tomorrow. 